time in our history that we seem so befuddled and overwhelmed with many problems, major problems that you know the earth has in terms of overpopulation or pollution or global warming or diseases and by this point we were supposed to be so on top of things and f driving flying cars that it, it's a little bit sometimes I get the feeling that we're gravitating to cyberspace and the network because we take solace from the fact that it, we know at its core it's finite I mean, sure, you'll never get to the end yeah. of it, but we know at its core, if you really have to break it down, it won't frustrate the hell out of you, like trying to figure out, well, explain time to me, because, you know, what's the present, what's the past, what's all these standard philosophical questions that we can never really get satisfaction from. We know we can explain time in cyberspace, you know? And I just wonder, I, I sort of sometimes think that it's, that what I what I'm a little concerned about is whether it's coming whether coming to grips with the infinite with the mystery is a, a key part of what we are as humans mm. and that if we move further and further into a realm where we we fool ourselves in a way that we now have moved into a world of control of much greater controls separate from the world that we were born into that we're going to lose some of what makes us particularly unique and that the problem of dealing with infinite problems and some which can never be solved is the, the, what spurs us on to the best growth. No, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, I, I, I get where you're coming from. I guess there's another way I think about it, which is that we use play in cyberspace to rehearse skills that we then can mobilize to <clears> deal with more complex problems. So Jane McGonigal, the, who's a game designer, talks has done research on alternate reality games uh, like the Beast, like I Love Bees, and she found that these complex teams emerged to solve the really difficult problems the games pose. That they're designed to be solvable, but they're designed to require many people working together to crack Enigma codes and translates between languages and figure out GPS locations. Yeah. Then, and what she found was that that when they stopped feeding them games, that the people started turning their minds to campaign finance reform, to crime, the Washington Sniper. She's got a number of examples where these communities that emerged playing games tried to tackle real world problems. But what they discovered was the real world problems were designed not to be solved, and the problems in the game were designed to be solved. And so... So what happens? In some cases, people retreat back into the games, yeah. and in other cases, people dig deeper into the complex problems and that the game was a rehearsal mm -hmm. just in the same sense that in a, in a hunting mm -hmm. society you play with bows and arrows until you're good enough to hunt game mm -hmm. in an information society no, I, you play with information until you're yeah, ready I get the to track, uh, track information and so but it's interesting that the, there was a divide or split where some people went on to solve the problems and others went back to the game. And yeah, it's all, that split is almost, I think, like liberals and conservatives, where liberals seem more prepared to deal with, with the messiness of the universe, yeah. and the conservative mindset says, no, I'd rather have some explanation, you know, I yeah, don't... even if it's wrong, I, I want to hold on to this answer. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, give me the pages in the book that show me what it is, and I'll believe in it.